are your ways, great are your works. Let's stay tonight. We're going to the book of Romans, chapter 10. Starting at verse 8. If you have your Bibles, if you have your notes, uh, the, the handout has Romans 10, verses 8 through 21 on it. Printed for you. Hallelujah. Romans 10, starting at verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith. Say the word of faith. You have, you need a word of faith. Guess what? It's nigh to your mouth. It's in your heart. That's how close the word of faith is to you tonight. Because it's something that we preach and we teach. That's what the Apostle Paul says. We preach. For if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich, and to all that call upon his name. For whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I have found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. To Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands. But I've stretched forth to them who are disobedient who are gainsaying. Shows you how much he cares about each and every one. Regardless of how far they strayed, how far they wander away, how much of a disobedient lifestyle they're living, he still has stretched forth his hand. Hallelujah. Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that you desire once again to stretch forth your hand. But Lord, tonight I trust that you're stretching forth your hand towards individuals that are being obedient to your word. Lord, let your word be in our mouth as it is in our heart. And Lord, that we can stand upon your word, which is our foundation. And we just give you praise in Jesus' name. Yes. Everyone said in Jesus' name. Yes. Jesus. Turn to your neighbor. Shake a hand or two as you're seated. Hallelujah. We see that throughout Paul's life, he had a passion for his people. God's people need to have a passion for people. 
not just because they're like faith or like color, like skin, but that uh, you may be seated. Uh, that you have a passion for people because you love people and people are lost. We need to love those who are saved and those who bring comfort to us and love those people that uh, surround us uh, with encouragement. But we need to have a genuine love for the people that are lost that they don't know or don't understand or maybe they're a little stubborn in their understanding. Because Paul loved the Jews, of which he was also a Jew, but he loved them enough that he wanted them to be able to ac accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. The, G the Jews didn't have a problem with accepting Jesus as a good philosopher, as a good moral man. Uh, they even acknowledged to their dislike that he went around doing good even if it was healing on the Sabbath day or doing some things that they thought was against the law they couldn't discount what Jesus did even though they didn't understand how he did it or understand why he would choose to perform a miracle or use a parable of a Samaritan which the Jews despised. You know, he always used things that despised those holy people, the self-righteous people. But you see, Paul, he wanted them to turn to Jesus. He wanted to reach their heart so they would turn from sin and be saved. Paul knew that the way to salvation is through faith in Christ Jesus. For the blood of bulls and goats could no longer put a person in right standing with God. Once a year, approximately October 4th, the priest would go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies with the blood of a slain animal and sprinkle that blood upon the mercy seat. They would go in behind the curtain with the incense that would bring about a cloud of smoke that represented the presence of God so that God could look upon the mercy seat and not see the man. Because if God looked upon the man behind the holy of holies, that man would not survive. But the, the incense, the cloud amongst the... the uh, mercy seat God saw the mercy spared the man the priest yes that time period gave a nation a right standing with God for one more year and that all it gave them just it bought them one year and yet what Jesus done through the shedding of his blood and this is why Paul was trying to reach to their heart but we no longer are offering bull sacrifices blood sacrifices Jesus shed his blood and now his blood covers us continually see the Jews were religious we have people today that are religious and they're lost Paul understood that you can be religiously lost. But he, 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 Paul didn't want them religiously lost. He wanted them to be righteously saved. We see that the Jews, many of the Jews, even many of the Jews today, are very good people, very loving, very giving. But just because a person is good and giving doesn't mean they're saved. So many are stuck in their traditions of their forefathers. They have not comprehended that faith in the work of Jesus Christ replaced their work of continual animal sacrifice. As many with people today, the Jews could not imagine that God had already 
provided for them his righteousness. Many Christians today participate in rituals that will leave them unchanged. They go say their prayers. They may light a candle. They may, you know, give an offering or they may do uh, uh, how much? How much? They may uh, patronize the church. But through all of this, it's just a ritual. They walk in and they walk out the same way, unchanged. But like Cornelius, that are devout, they pray regularly to God. But see, like Cornelius, now Cornelius was a Gentile, you know, the heathen people. Even though Cornelius meant well, Cornelius was still lost. The 21st century church should possess the same passion that consumed the Apostle Paul. A passion for lost souls to receive a life-changing new birth experience with Jesus Christ. Romans 10 and verse 4 for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. We see that earlier in Paul's letter to the Romans. He explained that the commandment should have brought life. But because of the weakness of sinful flesh, it brought death. We see that every person lived by the commandments they would have life. But mankind was unable to keep the commandments of God. Therefore, the commandments brought condemnation. We see, we see that even during the time of Christ. How the Pharisees, you know, they try to institute every, you know, commandment they themselves could not keep. They made it a burden for those who did not even try to keep the commandments. That the law should have brought life, but it brought death, it brought condemnation. Now, how did Christ become the end of the law? Now, Paul declared in Romans chapter 8 and verses 3 and 4, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of, it wasn't, he was in sin, but in the likeness of sinful flesh. What made his flesh different than our flesh? He was not conceived of a, a sinful male nature. God overshadowed Mary and conceived of her was the Holy Ghost. And from that uh, birth, uh, Jesus Christ. So he had no earthly father figure except the one in Joseph. So God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled after the spirit. Uh, the Greek word translated as end in Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 comes from the same Greek word, root word in the other forms of the verses that is translated perfect or complete or finished. As an example, uh, Jesus in his intercessory prayer stated in John chapter 17 and verse 4, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. But when he had met the demand of the law on the cross. He cried out, it is finished. So see, here's where that Greek word end comes into play. Complete. Finished. The price for mankind's redemption has been paid and the requirement has been satisfied or fulfilled. 
you know, it is a great thing if you have a time pay plan and you're faithful every month, whether you're paying $10 on your time pay plan, or if you have a layaway. You know, they say, well, you need to put 50 cents a week on your layaway or come in every, every two weeks and pay on your layaway. But it's a great feeling when you go in and you make the last payment on your layaway and they stamp your receipt paid in full and then you get to take all your purchases home. Or it, it's such a good feeling when you go in and pay that bill and they stamp it paid in full. You know you don't have to show up at their gates anymore. You don't have to show up their window and turn loose of whether it's $10 or $100. That's the same way when we as sinners come face to face with Jesus Christ. His work at Calvary, when he said it was finished, it was stamped, paid in full. Our redemption has been paid in full. Thank God for the blood. Oh, hallelujah. There is nothing else upon which we rely for salvation. It's only the work of Jesus Christ and the cross. Only our option for re redemption is by faith to embrace the cross and then to obey the gospel. You see, faith and obedience work hand in hand together. Obedience to the gospel will initiate in us that new birth through which we become new creatures in Christ Jesus. And when we become new creatures in Christ Jesus, it frees us from the old law of sin and of death. You know, some of Paul's words in the book of Romans uh, have been badly abused and misused and even misunderstood. Uh, some individuals, they, uh, they might tend to skip over uh, these verses because they maybe uh, truly not understand them. But we do know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and that we are not to avoid a verse or verses or simply explain a verse away just because it doesn't suit us or we're not sure what it means so we'll just kind of skip over it. But what we ought to do and what we need to do is study the scripture that we don't understand until we understand it. Pray that God would give us a revelation of what the scripture is saying so we get the right interpretation. We know that Paul declared that we obtain the righteousness of faith, uh, of righteousness of God by faith. Uh, these verses in no way indicate that uh, we do not need to be born again. You know, so many beliefs, they skip over the book of Acts where salvation is taught where it was caught. They want to skip over the books of Acts and jump into Romans, which, remember church, Romans is not written to the sinner. It's not written to the unconverted. It is written to the church. Those who have, that have already been baptized in Jesus' name, those that are, have already received the infilling of the Holy Ghost, they're already walking in holiness and righteousness. Sometimes they were struggling with their holiness and their righteousness, just like many to do today. So it's that human nature that we still have to deal with. And that's what who Paul was talking to. So but yet many faiths, beliefs, they want to jump to the book of Romans and say, well, all you have to do is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you're saved. Well, let's go back to the church. That's where part of our foundational substance is in which we build our faith. But once we've established and been established in salvation, then when we come into a, a, an area, a problem that we struggle with, we can confess with our mouth what? 
We confess our faults. We confess our sin. We confess to the Lord that we're not perfect. We made a mistake. That's when God is faithful. He is just to forgive us of our sins. It's not that we have lost faith or lost hope in Him. And neither has He lost faith and hope in us. When we are a little disobedient or rebellious or stubborn. But we know that when we call upon Him, He will hear us. And, and then at that point, yes, we may, we just, we're not justifying our mistake, but He justifies us as if we hadn't made a mistake when we confess our sin. You know, repentance of sin, baptism in Jesus' name for the remission of sins, receiving the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, is a, are not mystical actions. They bring about the new birth and the forgiveness of sin because they express a person's obedient faith in Christ's words. Jesus Christ has sacrificed for all. For the Jew, for the Gentile, you know, for the, the heathen in South America, the heathen in Africa, the heathen in Asia, even the Anglo-Saxon. You know, he gave his life for all mankind. His atoning work alone is sufficient to bring about the new birth in us by faith. We see that faith is the common not the common denominator for all people who desire the blessing of God. You know, uh, some uh, religions say that speaking in tongues is not necessary into salvation. It's an additional blessing. There was uh, one prolific uh, author uh, that had worked among a certain group of people in a certain city. And he was of a certain persuasion. He started a, uh, a home for drug addicts. And one thing this minister recognized, even though in his denomination it was just a blessing, that if you want the Holy Ghost, you can have it, otherwise it's not needful to salvation. But these people that went through his rehab program just confessing with their mouth and believing in their heart that they're saved, many of them went back into the life of drugs. But those who had come in and they had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, many more stayed clean from drugs. And this ministry began to examine the difference between those who were saved and then these who had the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Just because they confessed did not give them strength, did not give them power to rise over their addiction. These who had been, uh, had experienced the Holy Ghost had been given so much more power and authority made a difference in his rehab because he began to strive for 100% conversion and not just a, a blessing or an optional thing because he saw the difference. Isn't that amazing? That there is a difference when a person is filled with the Holy Ghost. The, the, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you are filled with the Spirit of God. And that is our common denominator tonight, saints. We have something that's in common because we have been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hebrews 11, verse 6 that I quoted tonight, without faith it is impossible to please God. But faith in Jesus Christ provides access to the greatest blessing of all. And that is the salvation from sin.
You see, the, uh, the birth, the life, the atoning death of Jesus Christ destroyed the barrier that once separated the Jews and the Gentiles and discouraged Gentiles from even attempting to approach God. Now see, under the law, going back to Moses' law, the law did not bar a Gentile from being a proselyte or converted Jew. You know, if me being a Jew, one, I mean, being a Gentile, want to be a Jew, I could be a Jew. But it did bar me from certain things and certain activities that was only allotted to the Jews. Certain celebrations, certain feasts was only allowed for the Jews, a true Jew. Not those who were you know, brought in, converted to, Ju uh, to Judaism. But see, through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no dividing wall. There, it brought us all under the same umbrella. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing that once before a Gentile could not approach God. See, it caused them to even give a second thought knowing that I don't have a right to approach God. But today, we have been privileged. It's an honor that we're able to walk into the throne room of where God's presence is and we can lift our hands and say, God, thank you that I'm here in your presence and I have to fear death or being struck down. I don't have to fear that I don't have the right heritage or the ancestry to have the door of salvation open to me. You know, it is, the, the obstacle has been removed. The barrier has been destroyed. The inner wall has been torn down. That we're able, we're all able to go into the Holy of Holies. No longer do animal sacrifices and the keeping of the Sabbath satisfy the demand of the law. Faith has become the common denominator for all of mankind. And Jesus Christ is the central focus of our faith. Oh, hallelujah. Peter you know, ushered in the New Testament principle when he preached his first sermon. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 21, he is said, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what Peter was speaking to his audience after they came out of the upper room, whether he was on the midway stairs preaching down to them, or whether he was on the last couple steps preaching at them. He said, you know, there was a time when you call upon the name of the Lord didn't mean you're going to be saved. But I'm going to tell you something. Everyone can call upon the name of the Lord today and you will be saved. Then he began to preach to them and he didn't just stop there, but he began to preach to them about the Jesus whom they crucified. And he began to preach to them about what Joel pro promised or what was prophesied that in the last days I pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Isn't that amazing? All flesh? He didn't say, uh, Joel didn't say, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon just the Jewish nation or upon Israel. But he said, all flesh. See, our God is an inclusive God. He's not an exclusive God. He is an inclusive, all, everyone. Now we can exclude ourselves and say, well, you know, wait a minute. I don't see it that way. I don't believe it that way. So I'm not going to follow it that way. So we exclude ourselves from the inclusive God who said, all. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. 
and your sons and your daughters and your old men and your maidens, you know, they're going to prophesy, you'll see visions and dream dreams. Oh, hallelujah. And yet, we see the principle, then after that, he began to preach to them about true salvation because they asked the question, what must we do to be saved? And Peter did not bellyache and wishy-washy said, repent of your sins. Be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Like I said this morning, the promise. The promise. But this promise is unto you, your children. We're talking about generations now. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's today. He's still calling. You see, that which was a stumbling stone to some became a stepping stone to eternal life for others. Ooh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let, let, let's not stumble over the stone. But let's step on the stone. Let's stay tonight. Great is your power. Great is your strength. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great are your ways. Power. Great is your power, great is your strength.